Hello and welcome to one and all. So in today's class, we will continue with the remaining points of the characteristics of developing economies with special reference to India. So in the previous class, we have discussed about some characteristics in comparison with the developed countries also. But the remaining features, uh, some of the features are peculiar only with the developing countries. Okay, so side by side, we will see what are all the peculiar features of the developing countries and what I, whatever wherever we can compare with the developed countries, we'll continue to do so. Okay, so uh, the next distinction between the uh, developed and developing countries is the about the demographic features. So as I mentioned, in most of the developing countries, the size of population is very high, the density of population is high, the growth rate of population is quite high, and coupled with high infant mortality, low life expectancy, like that, etc. So that we will see uh, with the data, we will see what how it, these data are differing from the developed countries. So when you talk about the total in the first one, we'll check the, the total size of population between the developed and the developing countries. So if you say China, of course, as of now, the highest populated country, 1.4 billion, and very soon India is going to overtake, and we are having a population of 1.3 billion. As of now, India is the second largest populated country in the world. And it is also said that every fifth person in the world is an Indian, and every third poor person is in the world is also an Indian. Okay, that's a dubious distinction we have got. So when you talk about the compare it with the developed countries, so the third largest populated country is USA, and you can see the difference, which is only three forty million. So that there's such a huge gap between the second largest populated country and the third largest populated country. Okay, and then when you come to the next one, what about the density of population? So density of population, the average number of people per square kilometer. Okay, that is the density of population. So as far as India is concerned, it's 373 per square kilometer. And China, 141 per square kilometer. So the, the world average is 60 per square kilometer. Now you can see the difference. This is as of 2019, okay? So you can see that 60 per square kilometer and you can see the density of population uh, in all these underdeveloped countries. The next indicator what we are having is the, what is the average annual growth rate of population. So the growth rate of population uh, is calculated based on the birth rate minus average annual birth rate in the country minus in the death rate in the country. So we will get the net growth rate in a particular country. So the average annual growth rate in a country Approximately in all these developing countries, the growth rate happens to be somewhere around 2% per annum, which is supposed to consider to be very, very high. And even as far as India is concerned, as per the latest census, the last census was in 2011. So India is concerned, just 1.64% per annum. Still we have having a long way to go to, I mean, the growth rate of population should not uh, exceed more than 1%. 2% is all very high. So we are nearer to the 2%. So sometime back during the 1980s, the growth rate of uh, population during that period, that de particular decade, the growth rate was almost around 2.1%, 2.2%. So from that level, we have decreased to 1.64% per annum due to various methods adopted by the country. But still, we have a long way to go 
before reaching to that less than 1% per annum. So if you take the same case with the uh, developed countries, it is approximately, on an average, it is 0.7% per annum. Okay, so the size of population is less, the growth rate of population is less because they are able to control the birth rate and also the density of population is also quite uh, less in all those countries. Okay, and the next indicator what we are having is, what about the, the average life expectancy? So the average life expectancy, the developing countries, it is approximately 51 years. That is the average lifespan of the uh, citizen of the country in the developing countries. And as far as India is concerned, 69.4 years. This is as per 2019. And when you take, uh, consider the developed countries, it is around 75 years. Okay. When you, but when you could talk about some of the countries like Japan and all, it is more than 1995 years. So on an average in the developed countries, this is the lifespan of the country. And apart from that, the infant mortality rate, the life expectancy and then uh, rate of infant mortality uh, says about the health standards of a particular country. Okay. So if the life expectancy is low and the infant mortality rate is high in a particular country, then that means the, uh, what do you say, the health standards are not very good because these two categories of people are the most vulnerable to diseases and other things. So the next one is a, what is the infant mortality rate, the IMR. So infant mortality rate, the number of children dying uh, per thousand ch children born Sometimes it is calculated, calculated before reaching the age of one year or before reaching the age of five years. Okay, so here let me put the world average first. The world average is twenty eight per thousand. Twenty eight babies dying per thousand babies born. That's the world average. And as far as uh, India is concerned, it was. 44 per thousand in 2010 and slightly decreased 37.8 per thousand in 2018. I mean, this data will not say anything unless we compare it with the developed countries or the some countries are having more than India, uh, the infant mortality rate and some of the countries are having much, much lesser than India. Then if you compare the data, then you will know where we stand. Okay. So if you take, going to the most, le very least developed countries, like for example, Angola, it is as high as 65.8 per thousand. Mozambique, these are all the, some of the African countries which are all uh, very uh, least developed countries. So 64, point, so 64 per thousand. But if you come to the developed countries, for example, Australia, it is 4.2 per thousand. Denmark, I mean, all these data you need not to remember. I'm just for your comparison, this is the, uh, so that you will know how, where, we, where India stands, okay? So everything only when uh, relatively you uh, speak about, then you will know the difference. So it is only 3.2 per thousand in Denmark. If you take Finland, 2.5 per thousand. UK, 4.2 per thousand. And USA, 5.7 per thousand. Then you can see that if you compare all these data and where India stands. Okay. So we have a long, so this uh, clearly shows the development of health facilities in the country. Okay, so because as I mentioned, the life expectancy, the and as well as the infant mortality rate, any uh, if the health standards are not good or up to the mark in a particular country, 
it immediately reflects in the average life expectancy and high infant mortality rate. So the most vulnerable sections of the population. So that shows that India has a long way to go in improving the health standards of the country. Okay. And then the next point uh, we are having is the, again, continuation because of the high population or every facility, whatever the facilities with the, the country is trying to provide, it is not sufficient because of the both the size of population as well as the growth rate of population. So high rate of illiteracy. So this is again one of the very common features of almost all the underdeveloped countries. Okay. So now again, so it is in uh, on an average in the developing countries, the literacy rate is somewhere around 65%. And as far as coming to India, it was 2011, the literacy rate was 74%. And if you segregate between the male literacy and female literacy, males 82% and female literacy rate was 65%. And 2022 slightly increased 77.7%. And over a period of time, uh, the data prove that there is a slight increase in the literacy rate of the, the rate of increase in the literacy rate of females seems to be better than the rate of increase in the literacy rate of the males okay but the same case in 1951 the literacy rate of india in 1951 was only 18 is also india in 1951 it was only as low as 18.3 percent so it was uh, considered during the only two out of 10 persons are considered to be literate in India during the period, during 1950s. So from that, we have come a long way. So from improved to almost 77%, but still even 77%, even today, if you consider the fact that nearly 23 to 20 to 25% of the population in the country are illit illiterate. So that is not a good sign, isn't it? We are, after so many decades, it's such a modern uh, development uh, taking place in the country as well as all over the world. If you say in your country, nearly 20 to 25% of the population are still illiterate, that is not a very uh, good sign, isn't it? Okay. And when you the same thing, if you compare it with the developed countries, it is on an average, it is around 95%. But some of the countries like Finland, Norway, Luxembourg, Greenland, etc. Some of the countries, these all these countries, the literacy rate is 100%. So, even so, that shows that we have we have a long way to go. And on the top of it, what how we are de defining literacy? Literacy is nothing but it's a very basic definition, the very basic meaning, reading and so literacy is basically de defined as reading and writing skills. And sometimes it also is, should be able to put your own signature. That's all uh, we are taking into account. If you take some more uh, parameters like uh, uh, writing a proper sentence without any grammatical mistakes in English, what is the, at least the basic calculations, addition, subtraction. So if you take some uh, even some of those other parameters, then the literacy rate will even still fall in a particular in, in the country. So just by reading and writing skills and putting your own signature, if you are having some only seventy seven percent, then imagine if you are taking the other parameters also. And if the human development index we all discussed about it. What is the meaning of human development index? which takes into account the health, life expectancy, the educational attainment, and of course the per capita real GN, GNP of a country. So human development report, if you remember, India was 129. The rank of India was, this is a 
Human Development Rank of India. It was 129 in 2018. We fell down to, slipped to 130 in 2020. And again, still we've fallen down to, dropped again to 132 in 2021-22. So that shows, so if you are falling in the rank, rankings of Human Development Index, that shows the progress is not very good in, in, these, in all these areas. Okay, then the next characteristic, these are, these are all some of the peculiar features of the underdeveloped countries, is something called as a dualistic economy. So a dualistic economy in the sense, you're in a country, uh, some of the sectors are advanced, and some of the sectors are still remain remaining backward. So the advanced sectors, they are using all the modern methods of production, but the other sector is using the traditional and outdated methods of production. So both are operating, both the kind of techniques of production are operating side by side. So that's what we can call it as a dualistic economy. And most of the developing countries, again, they come and they have this system of economy, or in other words, the coexistence of organized so organized in the sense developed and unorganized which is underdeveloped sectors in an economy so that is what is known as the dualistic economy so organized in the developed uh, sector that that sector uses all the modern methods of production but then the unorganized sector they use the uh, more outdated and traditional methods of production so if you say what agriculture is the comes under the category of unorganized and the same if you uh, talk about the industry and the service sectors they come under the category of organized. And even within agriculture also, you can make a segregation. So what is happening, whatever the progress made by the industry or the service sector by using the modern methods of production, it is nullified by the uh, unorganized sector, especially agriculture, which is having a major role in, the, in countries like India. Okay. So even in when you take agriculture also, we are finding a, within agricultural sector itself, we find that organized and unorganized segments. So what is organized within the agricultural sector? So organized comes into any form in the area of land or the acres of land, the percentage of land in the country or percentage of farmers are using the modern methods of cultivation using tractors, pump sets, irrigation facilities, seeds, fertilizers. So that, they, they, that percentage of land area and irrigation facilities. So that percentage of land area, they come under the category of organized uh, sector within agriculture. But unfortunately, majority of the farmers, uh, they don't have the, they cannot afford all these modern methods of cultivation. So they use all the traditional methods of cultivation depending on rainfall so so within the agricultural sector itself we are finding the traditional methods instead of tractors they use bullock carts no proper marketing so here if you are having tractors here you the majority of the uh, farmers they use only the bullock carts so like that i mean some of the examples i'm giving you so within the agricultural sector also, you are finding the organized and the unorganized segments. Unfortunately, this segment is greater than the organized. And the percentage of the farmers using the modern methods of cultivation is much lesser than the percentage of the farmers using the traditional methods of cultivation. And even when you talk about the industry and the service sector, so if you take the, within the industry itself, Again, you have the organized and unorganized. 
so all the the large scale industries which are ca capital intensive all the large scale uh, industries which are capital intensive using the, uh, the uh, modern methods of production so these industries they come under the organized sector modern methods of production because they are more capital intensive than the labor intensive you know that and what about the unorganized sector so all the small scale and cottage industries so the small scale and cottage industries which are using the traditional outdated methods as well as these industries are labor intensive so they use outdated methods of production and they are more labor intensive so they come under the category of so this this is capital intensive so they come under the category of unorganized sector and if you take the service sector just one example if you if, if you take the financial sector especially so organized and unorganized on the one hand we are having the modern banking system commercial banks and other financial institutions which are have i mean properly developed banking system which are having the come under the organized sector other financial institution so maybe the rate of interest is low or or reasonable okay so rate of interest based on the market rate but whereas you have on the other side we have that indigenous bankers money lenders so these come under the unorganized sector and we all know that these people charge a very high rate of interest and most of this um farmers in the rural area and all these small scale and cottage industries most of the people they obtain loan only from the uh, unorganized sector because they cannot afford to go to the they don't have the ability also to understand all those formalities and these unorganized sector these money lenders and indigenous bank bankers are easily available accessible and available to them so majority of them they take loan only from they borrow only from the unorganized sector like money lenders and all those problems associated with money lenders are happening in the country okay so the problem is uh, countries like india the segment of unorganized sector is much much higher than the segment of the organized sector in short urban economy comes under the organized and rural economy comes under the unorganized so you know the percentage of uh, india the urbanization is only around uh, 30% so remaining 70% of the population it is still the rural area so the rural economy is much but the percentage of the rural economy is much much higher than the urban economy in our country so this is, what what is happening here this leads to economic dualism economic dualism means for the more wherever the organized sector wherever the modern methods of production is happening then the output is increasing the employment is increasing and the income is also increasing but then one another batch of the people who are under come and coming under the unorganized sector is everything the opposite so there is uh, too much of income inequalities because of the lack of development in those sectors their income generation capacity is very very less so this is economic dualism like right? to put it in other words this is the inequalities in income so this economic dualism is leading to the social dualism all those problems the backward and uh, you know corruption all those riots protests all the unrest in the economy all this because of the uh, disparities in the income between one sector of the country and another sector of the country disparities between one section of the population in the country and another sector uh, batch of population in the country so this economic dualism leads to social dualism and all those problems are erupting because of this reason okay so most of the underdeveloped countries they are having this uh, what you say economic dualism and then the next uh, feature is the this we have seen several times underdeveloped 
natural resources. We have seen before, isn't it? Because of want of capital, technology, accessibility. So most of these countries, they are not able to, countries like Africa, they don't have technology or capital, so they are not able to utilize. Countries like India, because of, uh, you know, not properly managing the resources, we are not able to use the resources properly. Okay, then the next one, lack of entrepreneurship. So this also we have seen due to lack of motivation, lack of assistance to the private sector or too much of restrictions on the private sector um, without inadequate infrastructural facilities. So all these are leading to lack of entrepreneurial development in the country. But however, recently there is a, in 2021-22, there is a monitor called the GEM. That is a global entrepreneurship monitor. So they are placing India as a, as of now in 2021-22, in spite of this, India is uh, considered to be in the uh, one of the top five economies in the entrepreneurship because of the, as we all know that because the startup is giving more and more of encouragement in our country. So India is improving the ease of doing business index also India is improving, but still we are still not there long way to go. And the, another major problem all these countries are facing is something the unemployment. So unemployment and also another one, disguised unemployment. So we have uh, what we are facing in our country. So these are mainly underdeveloped countries and I'm especially referring to India. So we are facing in urban areas, we are having a sort of unemployment, which is open and educated. So educated unemployment. This is because one is more and more uh, students are graduating and they are not, I mean, they are not getting jobs because that much amount of industries are not developed in the country. That is again, maybe because of lack of capital or whatever industries are not able to absorb the all the uneducated youths in the country and and they even though they are qualified i mean to a reasonable extent that is one thing and also most of the people they are shifting from the rural areas to the migrating from rural areas to the urban areas in search of job because they want to leave the agricultural sector and come and employed in the industries or factories in the urban areas so for that uh, the, there should be development of the industries in the urban areas, but that kind of development is not happening in the country. So the demand is demand for labor force is not there in the country. So that is what is this called as the structural unemployment. Anyway, urban areas we are having this kind of open and uh, educated unemployment due to lack of development of industries in the urban areas, and we are having in the rural areas. We are having. It is not open, it is disguised. Disguised means hidden. You, you are not able to find out that who is employed and who is not properly employed. So disguised unemployment, because in a uh, disguised unemployment means more number of people are em, uh, employed in a particular job than the people who are actually necessary. So this actually happens in the agricultural sector where only five laborers are enough to do the work, there might be 10 laborers employed. So if you remove that extra file laborer also, then the productivity is not going to decline. Or in other words, you say the marginal productivity is zero. So this extra file laborers, they appear to be employed, but they are not actually employed. So out of the total 10 laborers employed, how do you identify these are all the five laborers who are actually employed and these are all the five laborers who are not actually employed. So that's why it is a disguised unemployment because agriculture is a, I mean, no need for any qualification. And also it is a family, like a family business. So there's where people keep on getting employed in a form, even though it is not necessary. So that is one type, kind of unemployment. And we also, and as per the United Nations uh, report, approximately 20% to 25% of the people in the rural area are disguisedly unemployed in all the underdeveloped countries. And another type of unemployment we are finding is seasonal unemployment. In agriculture, only during a particular season, they have uh, work and the remaining uh, season, they, they are jobless. So that is the kind of 
uh, unemployment we are talking. So this is about the nature of unemployment. When you come to the X, this is the nature of unemployment in the country. And when you come to the extent of unemployment in the country, see uh, what is happening. Uh, this, the on the one hand, the population in the country keeps on increasing. And on, and on the other hand, the industries are not developing that much in the country. And year after year, and to a certain extent, the colleges, universities, they all, they all keep on increasing. I mean, when you compare to what it was at the time of independence to now, the, the number of schools, the number of colleges, the number of universities, they all keep on increasing. So what is happening? So many youth are getting graduated, coming out of the colleges and universities, seeking for job. But the country is not able to provide, absorb all the labor force who are coming out of the colleges. And because of this, the backlog of unemployment keeps on increasing in the country. For example, in the if you in the 11th plan, as far as India is concerned, in the 11th plan, that is it was between 2007 to 2012, the backlog of unemployment was 37 million. That is from the previous uh, five-year plan who, are, who were unemployed. And new entrants, so new entrants happen to be 45 million. So total 82 million. But towards the end of the uh, 11th plan, the country could provide jobs only to 60 million people. So you can see so this is being the remaining 22 million. They are carried forward to the next five year plan. So this is what is happening. And even the next five year plan, within the five years, there will be new entrants in the labor market, is a job market, isn't it? So like that, the backlog of unemployment keeps on increasing. So as of the unemployment growth rate in India, it was 2017-18, the unemployment rate was 6.1%. And in 2022, February, it is 8 point increase to, you know the reason, 8.1%. The same 2022, April, it is slightly decreased to 7.5%. But still, as per the economists, this is still coming, even though it is it decreased, it is still considered to be very, very poor growth rate of employment opportunities in the country. Okay, so that is another major problem affecting all the underdeveloped countries. Then the next one, social factors. This again, we have already discussed, isn't it? The backward attitudes, customs, traditions, beliefs of people of the majority of the people in the underdeveloped countries. So that is also another common feature of all underdeveloped countries and foreign trade orientation. It's also, I have mentioned before, most of these, most of these underdeveloped countries, they export raw materials and primary products and import all the capital equipment and the finished product. So I already mentioned you, this too much dependence, ignoring the other sectors of the country, the country will be prone to international demand fluctuations. The market fluctuations keep on happening. So we will be prone to that. The country will not be stable. And on the, on the top of it, the country will have the balance of payments is nothing but it is a record of all the import receipts through exports and all the have the deficit in the balance of payment that means our uh, payments will all, always be more than it is not will always be india's uh, is always having the deficit in the balance of payments most of the time right from 1950s ex barring one or two years so finally what is happening the deficit in balance of payments when the foreign exchange reserves in the country sources in the country is yes, very very less okay so these are all uh, some of the main characteristics of all the underdeveloped countries. But in spite of the fact that uh, the uh, India's growth rate has tremendously increased compared to what it was before, even when you compare it during the British rule, what it was, compared to that, the growth rate of India is tremendous. And this is, uh, India is, as of now, India is considered to be one of the fastest growing economies among all the developing countries in the world. Okay, so with this, we finish with the first chapter and the next class we'll start with the next chapter and another thing is it is better you make a chart and you make a, a record of 
all the latest data. Okay, what is the literacy rate and of the world? What is the population profile, demographic profile of the world, developing countries? What is the unemployment rate? You know, all those infant mortality rate. So all this, if you keep a record of the statistical data, you will have a better, uh, you know, understanding of where the country stands. Okay. So next class, as I mentioned, I will start with the next chapter. So if you find this video useful, please like, share, and subscribe. And if you have any doubts or suggestions, please mention it in the comment box. So until my next class, take care. Bye-bye.